I'd like to talk about how to try and create a moving experience in virtual reality. That is, how can we give you the sensation of really being in and moving through this space without having to allow for actual physical locomotion, because typically you run into some walls or something like that, or need big motion simulators that we have at Max Planck, and Christy also has some amazing pieces, but I don't. So, and to do this, I'd like to talk a bit about different perceptual aspects and display factors in immersive virtual reality, but I hope a lot of them will actually transfer to other applications. I'm Bernard Rieke, I'm at Sam Fraser University School of Interactive Arts and Technology, where I lead the iSpace lab. So, I'd like to focus on the perception of self-motion. Being inherently mobile species, despite our sedentary lifestyle, I, I think it's still important that we really try, whenever it makes sense, to give people the sensation of really moving through the space wherever appropriate. So we have seen amazing 3D movies, and I wish I could create any cool uh, stereo content. You won't see anything in this talk, for sure. So can, how can we make the transition of uh, watching these amazing, beautiful scenes to really you being in the scene? and uh, moving through the scene. So how can we create the transition from you perceiving a camera motion to you perceiving an actual self-motion? So I'll talk about perception of self-motion. Um, and one fundamental question there is, well, do users really perceive what we intend and simulate? So we have all these great intentions, but does it really work? That is, it's pretty clear after seeing all these talks, especially if you talk to Marty Banks, that what the stimulus you present and what we perceive, it's not a simple one-to-one -one mapping. And even if we, we might get it right and perceive it properly, does it mean that we can really use it to behave naturally, to cognate, to, to think naturally, to act naturally? And I'd like to start this talk on just a few examples on the perception of the very basics of every kind of motion, so translations and rotations. I give an example of distance perception and rotation perception. So in the real world, when you ask people to estimate distances, they're amazingly accurate. So if you plot the actual judge distance over the correct uh, distance, people are really uh, right bang on. However, if you present this in virtual environments, uh, especially head mounted display, you see a considerable compression going on, and that's been replicated a lot of times. Uh, and even if you provide photorealistic cues as much as you can, it doesn't always help. And even stereo doesn't necessarily help in this situation. But there are other um, examples. This happens to be one of our own lab where we actually fail to replicate this uh, distance compression. So whether you use an HMD, a small monitor, or a big monitor, we didn't find any compression. So uh, without going into much more detail, if you really want to make sure that people perceive what you're seeing, like you probably have to test it, not just for your display, but also for a specific task and application. Just because you got this really wonderful, new, expensive uh, setup doesn't mean it works in the way you intend it. So how about rotations? Do you really perceive what we simulate? So just give two little examples of uh, an experiment where we ask people to produce a turn in a very simple optic flow or base environment. And what you can see appears, if people, you present it on a wide field of student screen, there's a little bit of error, but the error in producing these turns gets successfully larger if you reduce the field of view, and especially if you put a head-mounted display on. It's, it's actually uh, quite some errors in there. And also, uh, it depends on the geometry of your screen, and I wish we would have access uh, to the Christie screen, uh, because that probably would have fared a lot better. So basically, when you try and present a rotation on a flat screen, there's always some kind of sideways rotation component. So the geometry of the screen actually matters, and uh, if you can't get that right, maybe stereo uh, 3D might be a way to kind of compensate a little bit for this. The only screen we had access to, because we were not Christie, uh, that work was actually a wraparound screen. So on a panoramic 180 degree screen, people could really judge their self-rotation surprisingly accurate. So under certain conditions it works well, but it's highly dependent on display parameters. And uh, the, how you perceive the display surface itself, if you perceive it, can also make a huge uh, impact here. So, well, let's assume we would manage to somehow calibrate this so we perceive, uh, perceive translations and rotations properly. Does it mean that we can actually also behave the way we would normally do when we naturally move? And I'd like to try this out. If I could give <coughs> just a little bit of light in the audience, that would be perfect. So, I'll, give you, I'll ask you to, um, uh, to do a very simple task. Oh, thank you, wonderful. And it's very simple. At the end of a simulated, it's a very simple simulated self-motion, it asks you to point back to the starting point uh, um, just using your hand. 
So uh, you'll see something very simple like a translation, a rotation, then it'll ask you to point back. Um, so let's try this out. Hope the video is working. Oh, you, you can remove the sound. There's nothing useful there. So you'll see a very simple translation, rotation, and then another translation. And at the end of which I'll ask really everybody to, this is the interactive part, to really point to the origin. So please, and keep your hand out there. And now look around where people point. <laughs> now what you see is really uh, amazing. There's uh, uh, some group of people point to the left side, the other one points to the right side. So thanks for replicating the literature. This is actually an official finding, has been replicated a number of times. So here's the top down view of what's happening. So what you expect to happen if this would be a left turn is that people point back. So this, what you expect for what we call Turner. However, you see a large percentage of people in visually simulated environments that don't do this. They point to the opposite direction. So you really might wonder, what, what is going on? In reality, that would never happen. You don't have a single person even with eyes closed that doesn't know it's here. So something fundamental is missing here. Um, and the predominant uh, idea, after lots of experiments, of what mm -hmm. might happen is the following. So in their head, those people, they properly update the uh, the translation, but they have a problem updating the translation. They act as if they would not, not have turned. So mm -hmm. turn perception is really the, the key challenge in VR simulation for this mm -hmm. one. So if they point to the right side, in a way it makes sense, um, as indicated by this PowerPoint, wonderful animation here. Um, but this is not what we want, and this is definitely not what you observe in the real environment. So something is fundamentally not working in these simple simulations. Um, and uh, which in a way is a problem, but in a way it also gives us a very simple test on seeing, okay, of the, the power of the display itself. Um, and this, yeah, so, so sometimes up to 50% or even more of people fail to incorporate the visually presented rotations. So what can we do about this? Well, one possibility is, uh, if you have access to those, to use these wonderful motion simulators where you either allow people to physically walk or you can move them around. And these are great and wonderful, and they, they do indeed help. But, well, not everybody has the funds for this and doesn't fit in everybody's living room, especially if you live in Toronto or in Vancouver, where it's a little bit pricey. Um, so is there a way we could use all our knowledge about human multimodal perception, cognition, cue integration to come up with something more lean and elegant, maybe also affordable, to really take advantage of all we know so is there a way we could make the virtual field real by really exploiting these embodied illusions? Uh, so instead of physically simulating the motion, can we give you an embodied illusion that is actually so believable that you cannot distinguish it? And th this has long fascinated people um, thousands of years ago, when even back then, when you stared at some, some large field visual motion, like a waterfall or a river or something like that, you can get the sensation that you're actually starting to move. Uh, train illusion is another example. So why might we want to care about these? Well, first of all, I think they're pretty cool. It's one of the very few truly embodied illusions. It's a visceral, it's a, like a gut feeling. Uh, so it's not just in your brain. Um, I would argue they're interesting from a fundamental research point of view because uh, they always kind of investigate the interaction between, for example, visual cues on the one side that indicate that you're moving, and then other cues like a vestibular system that tells you you're not moving. So what happens then? And uh, I hope, or we propose, that they, these illusions might also help to make virtual reality and other immersive media more real by giving you the sensation that you would normally have. And indeed, these self-motion illusions have been shown to correlate with convincingness and naturalism, immersion, presence, and we also propose that they might help us to remain oriented, thus preventing disorientation in VR. So here's a simple animation, not a 2D, uh, like stereo 3D contract generator. So if I wish I could bring the series copically in front of you, but we can use a device that everybody has. You can just, like, you can fixate your hand while I, you observe the moving background stimulus. And if, uh, just kind of relax your eye. And this, if you happen to sit in one of the front rows, you might actually get the sensation that you are starting to drift. And if PowerPoint wouldn't jitter too much. Um, so the, the, in a way, this can be quite compelling. Did anybody get a little bit of the yeah. feeling? Okay, in the front rows, wonderful, thanks. One of the reasons to sit in the front rows. Um, 
So the classic apparatus to study these illusions, especially in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was this so-called optokinetic drum. So if you close this and draw, start rotating the drum, the stationary observer, after a few seconds, will get the sensation that they are really moving um, in a continuous manner. And it can be so compelling uh, that they cannot uh, distinguish it anymore from actual self-motion, especially if the, you have unlimited field of view. The smaller the field of view, the less intense and the longer it takes to get the illusion. So, um, yeah. And there's an even more amazing illusion that you can experience here in Toronto uh, if you happen to come to uh, York University. Um, they have this wonderful tumbling room. It's kind of a staged room that you can uh, rotate slowly around the stationary observer. And again, the larger the field of view, the more people actually get the illusion and the more intense the illusion gets. Like so how about virtual reality? Can we do similar illusions? So in one experience, we actually did use this kind of stimulus, rotated it in this direction around the observer, and uh, again, the faster the stimulus motion, the faster and the more intense uh, the uh, vection, the illusion, it starts earlier and is more compelling. So the stimulus velocity also has this effect. You, you can't really make it too fast, as we know here, because otherwise the images break up. But does it really matter that we have a consistent scene, like the one we used here? Oops, wrong button. And does it matter that you can feel present in the scene, so that we provide a naturalistic scene? So in an attempt to do this, we compared uh, the uh, intact ski, uh, ski scene with various sliced and scrambled up versions of the same one. And the idea is, that, well, in a way, it's the same local stimulus. You just add vertical uh, edges, which would predict stronger action, but you cannot be, feel spatially present in it anymore as easily. So if you look at the data, compare uh, the intact stimulus with the scrambled up one, you see it takes a lot longer to get the illusion. Um, there's, again, a benefit from speed, but there's still, you're still a lot slower in uh, obtaining the illusion if you don't have a naturalistic background, and it's not as convincing. So really having a consistent naturalistic scene really seems to enhance action. And if you ask people to rate presence in there, it's overall reduced for the inconsistent scene. People uh, report less involvement, uh, less realism, and l less of a sense of being in there. So together with other research, this really indicates that there are higher level cognitive influences on these illusions. And things like theme parks have uh, really exploited this quite well in trying to prime you to believe that you might be moving and other high level factors there. So I'd ju just like to summarize a couple of these factors. So definitely field of view is a huge factor. So for those who are lucky enough to have been in the IMAX uh, yesterday morning, uh, you can actually get, uh, just because of this wide field of view and high quality, you can get a strong sensation that you're actually moving in there. Visual velocity is a factor in there. Simulated viewpoint jitter, it's kind of like camera jitter, can enhance the illusion. Using naturalistic stimuli, ecological validity is an important factor. The possibility of actual self-motion. So if you know that you might be moving, for example, because a Disneyland theme park ride puts you in this actual vehicle or prop or plane or something like that, this can enhance the illusion. Uh, and there's a lot of visual factors like eye movements, uh, fixation for, uh, for example is an important one, stereoscopic depth cues can indeed help, although there's a lot of more research needed. Perceived background motion and a stationary foreground, that's why I ask you to put your stationary hand in front of the moving background so that what's, the background is normally what is stationary, so if that moves that seems to help in giving you a more compelling sensation of self-motion. And there's lots of cross-modal factors. So if you add moving, rotating sound, binaural simulation, vibration, subsonic, this all can enhance the illusion. Biomechanical cues, especially from walking uh, in circles, can actually give, by themselves give you an illusion and enhance the other modalities. Uh, surprisingly, linear action uh, on a treadmill doesn't seem to really help much. Uh, so it doesn't add to the illusion. So well, this is all nice. but. Well, if you get a really hardcore devil's advocate, they might think like, well, it's all, all nice and good, but is it really good for anything practical? Uh, does it, do these illusion enable us to do anything that we couldn't do otherwise? So we ask ourselves, well, could the illusion of self-motion really provide some of the benefits of actual self-motion? So what are those benefits? I mean, one is, for example, that even with a somewhat high cognitive load, because you're all watching, I move around, my brain automatically updates where I am, so I know that here's my screen, here's my audience, here's my podium, and here's my exit in case this doesn't work. 
Um, so, and this has low cognitive load. This almost runs in a parallel process in the brain. So it's quite convenient. And uh, this is a lot harder than asking you, for example, to imagine a new locomotion. So one uh, hypothesis was, well, could the illusion of moving to a new perspective actually facilitate this perspe perspective switch similar to an actual self-motion to this direction? Probably, or uh, maybe by triggering this automatized spatial updating process, and if this were true, this would be really neat because this might enable us to come up with a more embodied, natural and effective way to simulate those self-motions. And because we wouldn't have to move you that far, it might be more affordable. So here's uh, a recent experiment that I'd like to briefly talk about. So if you compare a uh, pointing error after a physical locomotion to an imagined locomotion, as predicted, it, it's harder to point accurately to previously learned objects after you're just being asked to imagine where it's actually moving uh, to this direction. So the question is, what happens if you give the, the illusion, embodied illusion of moving there? Would you get some of the benefits? And, well, at least in this study, it actually worked. So the self-motion illusion really gave you uh, almost the same benefit as an actual self-motion. So it could facilitate perspective switches. And uh, thus maybe help to ultimately enable us to remove or reduce the disorientation that can happen in virtual environments, maybe because of the lack of automatic spatial updating or intuitive na navigation in there. So in summing up, I, I hope to have convinced you that these self-motion illusions can be quite cool because they're really an embodied visual sense, which is, I guess, what you also often want uh, in movie theaters. Or sometimes you don't want this, so it's also important to know how not to evoke it. They're clearly interesting, at least to me, from a fundamental research point of view. Um, and they might help to make applications more compelling and realistic. Um, maybe, so there's more research needed, but they have been shown in the pr first studies to actually facilitate self-motion, uh, facilitate perspective switches. So they can help you imagine or update to a new viewpoint similar to actual self-motion. And these might be useful for actually preventing disorientation that often happens in virtual environments, especially if you're not physically moving. And so this ultimately uh, could enable us to come up with a more embodied, naturally and effective approach towards self-motion simulation. So maybe in the end we might not need, or not to the same extent, need these huge and wonderful motion simulators because we could just give you an illusion without having to physically move you. Thus, really helping us to get closer to the ultimate dream of virtual reality to really make it a reality in the sense that you can perceive as if it were real, that you can behave as if you were real, that it triggers a similar process in our brain as if you would be physically moving through this environment. That's it. Thanks for your attention, and I'd like to thank all the wonderful colleagues and sponsors.